Well, good morning. It's so nice to be with you folk at Bon Accord again. Thanks for having us back. And today uh, we're going to be looking at uh, prayer and justice. And I have to confess to you right off the bat, I'm not in the same headspace as it was last time I was here. Um, we had some leaks in our laundry room, which required taking off drywall, taking out insulation, getting rid of some mold. And that, of course, led me to think, hey, it'd be a good idea for me to rip up the carpet on the stairs going to the basement and then take out some of the drywall there. And so I've been renovating for the last three weeks, and the dust affects my sinuses and my sinuses affect my sleep. And so I've been a bit dough-headed lately. In fact, as proof of that, um, I recently was uh, given a new position at, uh, at the store I'm working at in the bakery section. And um, I worked um, this past week for the first time there. Uh, I was scheduled for the first three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday, they told me, um, oh, looks like you're working tomorrow at 5 o'clock. And I went, oh, really? Sandy was in Jasper for the week for her work, so I set my alarm and thought, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be able to get up in time, get to work, and, uh, and not be late. And I did it. I got, got to work at 5 a.m. And the person there said, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be here at 5 p.m. <laughs> went, oh. So that was a long day. And then Knox had a couple things on. There was a quartet that was going to be playing on Friday. And they had a work cleanup day on yesterday and Saturday. Well, that's what I thought. Actually, it's next Friday and next Saturday. And so, again, from the west end of Edmonton, I used all, all this gas to go to Knox twice, <laughs> Friday evening and then Saturday morning. Both times, there was nobody there. <laughs> So, yes, when I got here today, I'm so glad you didn't say, what are you doing here? <laughs> so anyway, um, I was curious about the, this connection between uh, the original email from Lynette said, um, uh, the spiritual disciplines, prayer, justice, and action. And I was talking to a friend of mine in uh, Kelowna and saying, you know, I, I get the prayer thing as a spiritual discipline. That, that makes a lot of sense. That's a common one. It's a, it's a very essential one. But I thought, you know, justice as a, a spiritual discipline, isn't it really an outworking of a spiritual discipline? If you draw near to God, if you're disciplined about cultivating that relationship with God, one of the outcomes will be that you act justly, as that famous verse in Micah 6, 8 says, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In another version I just found out uh, yesterday, it says to love faithfulness rather than mercy. And the point is, if we walk humbly with our God, cultivating that heart relationship as we communicate with him, then we will be prone to act justly, to, to discern what's going on here, what is the ultimate best in this situation for this person or that person. And we will be in a sense, uh, in tune with the one who is creator, judge, and savior of all. So what I want to present to you today is not ways to draw near to God in prayer, because it looks like you've been examining some of those, and those are very important, but rather outcomes of prayer and the reasons to pray as it pertains to justice. You know, as uh, you guys were singing, and it was interesting, they had two of the songs there were... Uh, had significance for me. Uh, the first one you sang, uh, My Lighthouse. When I worked at Hope Mission, they have an annual spring banquet where they invite like 800 people to this banquet. And it's a fundraiser. And it's a fundraiser which focuses on the two programs that they have there for getting people off the street and out of addiction. Wellspring is the women's program, and I was involved with the men's program called Breakout. And I remember vividly one spring, um, them all singing uh, My Lighthouse, and having walked with some of these men over that year as a year-long program, it was really gratifying to know that some of them were singing that from a place of faith that they had found light in their lives. They'd been able to now come out of a place of loneliness and self-hatred 
to a place of feeling that God was their father through Jesus Christ and that he was giving them both a light in their life and a home when they had once been homeless. The other song, um, King of Kings, I got talked into being part of a music ensemble for Easter at Knox and having to sing that, and again with my sinus issues, it was really hard to sing bass all the time. So, but anyway, as I was looking at uh, the scriptures, I was drawn to some psalms um, of Asaph. And you probably know that the, the psalms are 150 psalms. They're divided into five books. And Asaph has the distinction of introducing the third book in Psalm 73. And then he has several other psalms going into the 80s there. But who was Asaph? You might not know this. You, you might be familiar with David as the author of many of the Psalms. But there are a few other people that are accredited with the uh, authorship of some of the Psalms. You might also know the sons of Korah. But Asaph, as far as we know, was a Levite, a tribe of Levi, that David had assigned him and, and two others, so three in total, um, to be uh, singers of worship to the Lord and was involved with uh, David bringing the Ark of the Covenant up into Jerusalem. And uh, so he is credited with these psalms, but many scholars, having examined these psalms, see that you know a lot of the things that he's referring to in some of these uh, psalms of Asaph um, weren't current to David's time. It seems to be the time of the exile, the time of the fall of Judah. Uh, and, um, and so they think, well, the, dis the description, a psalm of Asaph, that designation, might refer to a group of people or a lineage of people from Asaph's time going down several hundred years to the time of uh, the captivity and the exile. Why did Judah go into that captivity? Why was the temple burnt? Why did Jerusalem fall to Nebuchadnezzar? Well, if you look at the book of Isaiah, again and again, God accuses his people of not acting justly. They were arrogant. They were self-serving. They ignored the needs of the poor and the needy, the widows, the fatherless. And they were making themselves rich at other people's expenses. And so there's a connection here with this whole idea of drawing near to God in prayer and to be a person who acts justly. Again, while we were singing, um, I was reminded of this documentary, Transformations. I don't know if you saw it years ago. It talks about different communities that were transformed. And I remember this uh, pastor from Kenya in this really impoverished neighborhood in Nairobi that was really down and out. This place, like every second building was a bar. And there was a spirit of witchcraft in that neighborhood. And nobody wanted to move there. And he felt God called him and his wife to be pastors there. And they actually took a former bar and they made it into what they called the prayer cavern. And as they prayed, that place was transformed. This, this infamous witch that operated there was finally ousted. Um, people came out of their addictions and their, their hopelessness and began to have a relationship with the living God to the point that businesses were now clamoring to move in there. People wanted to reside there and the place was transformed. And I always remember this, this, this pastor. He was just a short black man. And he said, prayer is talking to God. It is not easy. And I kind of thought, that's interesting. I would have thought, he said, it's easy. You want to see things change? Talk to God. Pray. But he said, it's not easy. And some of these Psalms of Asaph will tell us or remind us and maybe touch our own lives why it's not easy to pray to God sometimes. Why sometimes it seems like God's not even around. He's not even acting. I can pray, but who knows if he hears? And who knows if he acts? 
and we're going to look at some of those uh, those psalms. Just before we get to them, it might be worth noting that Psalm 1, which begins the first book in the book of Psalms, talks about two contrasting ways of living. There's the way of the wicked, the scoffers, the mockers, who just ignore the law of the Lord and do their own thing. There's the way of the righteous, who meditate on his word, who draw near to him. And they're supposed to flourish, aren't they? They'd be like a, a tree by, by a river, always in bloom, always fruitful. It sounds nice, doesn't it? But when you get to the beginning of the next book of Psalms, which is Psalm 42, you might know that one where, you know, my soul thirsts for God. I cry out for God, for the living God. Where can I find God? Now, here's a righteous person saying, well, yeah, I'm following in this path of God, but actually, my enemies are taunting, where is your God? And I, he himself is saying, actually, to be honest with you, I'm thirsty for God. I don't know where he is. And he says, my soul, why are you so downcast? Put your trust yet in God. And here in the third book, in Psalm 73, one that God has spoken to my heart again and again and again, Asaph is saying, you know what? It's not easy to follow God. I feel afflicted. I feel like I'm losing. And all of these arrogant, godless people, they're prospering. They're getting wealthier and wealthier. They're living carefree lives. I am trying to discipline myself like an athlete, and I'm sweating away, and I'm just feeling, what's the point? What's the point? I was reminded, um, I don't know if you remember, last time I was here, I referred to this book by a friend of mine, Rob Decote, um, Meditations for Spiritual Direction. He had this interesting observation that I read a couple of weeks ago, and it was about childhood development. And some of you are probably very well aware of childhood development. And he was referring to what um, uh, these people refer to as object permanence. Object permanence. Some of you know that. So a child, a baby, you know, when you play peekaboo with a baby, why is the baby so delighted with that? Because when you go like this, they think you've disappeared. And you go like this and go, boo. And they go, whoa, you're back again. <laughs> and he's saying that in those first few months, if an object, a toy, is before a child, they can see it, they can maybe hear it if it rattles or something like that, and you take it away, it's like it never existed. It's, it's just simply gone. It's disappeared out of the universe. But eventually, the child will get to the point of realizing if they just see a little bit of it, or they hear it behind a box or something like that, if you're, if you're ringing some little jingle bells, they know what it is. And they go, OK, I need to seek for this thing, because I remember it. And they look for it, and they find it. And they delight in it. And they, you see the big smile on their face. And eventually, when there's no sign of it at all, the child knows that that object, whether it's mum, whether it's the cat, whether it's a favorite toy or book, it still exists, even though I don't sense it. It's still there somewhere. I just have to look and find it. And he related that to the spiritual journey. And I want to relate that to some of these Psalms of Asaph, that when it seems like I don't see God anymore, I don't see any evidence that he is caring about justice in this world, that just like Asaph discovered in Psalm 73, yet he is still there. And as the New Testament says over and over again, we are to live by faith and not by sight. Do we have object permanence about the triune God who is good and just and loving? Or are we being distracted by the things of the world and the arrogant and the wicked that seem to be running this world and getting away with it?
Okay, so that's sort of a framework. The first song I want to make have you look at sort of just gives us some of those categories. Two of these psalms are very short, so don't worry. We'll get through them fast, and then we'll look at Psalm 73, which is the longer one, but has some really good content in it. So Psalm 75 says this. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks, for your name is near. Men tell of your wonderful deeds. You say, so here's God's voice, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge uprightly. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To the arrogant, I say, boast no more. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak with outstretched neck. It's a sort of a symbol of pride. No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt a man. But it is God who judges. He brings one down, he exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. As for me, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob. I will cut off the horns of all the wicked, but the horns, which is like the vigor or the strength of the righteous, will be lifted up. Here are some things I think we can learn from this. First of all, God is. We live in a secular culture. Uh, God is not present in our institutions, in our academies. Uh, we basically run this country, this civilization, as if God did not exist. But this tells us, first of all, God does exist. We are not our own. And here's another thing. He is approachable. He wants to draw near. That's what he said at the beginning, right? For your name is near, meaning his character, his presence is near. It can be, at least. This is a, a possibility. Because of who he is and what he's done, it's right to thank him, to recognize I'm dependent, actually, on God. I'm not just a self-made person. Because he's the creator, impartial and over and above the vested interests of people, he will judge and do so uprightly or fairly. He's not biased. He won't be persuaded by a bribe. He won't just go, well, you know, for the short-term goal, we're going to go this way. He, he looks at the big picture. Also, we can see from this psalm, although he's God over all, the earth and its people are not yet secure. They can quake. Something is amiss. That's what some people say. Well, look, if, if God is all-powerful, if God is all-loving, why is the earth in the state that it is? The Bible never says uh, or hides that fact. It says from the, the very beginning, we've gone astray, and now there are opposing forces. There's like the tectonic plates of, of autonomy going our own way, living as if we are God, and the, the kingdom of God. God's saying, look, you're not on your own. You're dependent on me. I've made you for my glory. And if, when those butt up, there's an earthquake, right? That's what happens with tectonic plates. And he says, I'm the one that keeps it secure. And that could be seen in the fact that there are many who are arrogant or wicked, living in rebellion. Lifting up the horn was like the idea of a bull um, rising against its owner uh, with its horns as if to gore that owner to death. It's saying, I don't need you. I'm going to uh, go my own way. But um, the quest to exalt oneself, to, to take of the things of the earth, to make oneself strong, and blessed and independent is really actually an injustice. Who's it an injustice to? To our maker. He doesn't just give us the earth so that we can dominate it and destroy it and just make ourselves um, independent of him. And in the end, it's futile. For he says, God will bring down or exalt. And we're gonna look at what's that based on? Why will God bring one person down and exalt another. What is he looking for in us that he will do this action? 
And so finally, therefore, the king, um, they, they say that those last two verses are probably the voice of the king, um, who has now considered these things. The king and all who are wise and good will not be impressed by the horns of the wicked, no matter how successful or influential they seem for a time, but will find security and strength in being righteous. Even if it's unpopular, even if there's a delayed gratification there, the reward is further down the road. So this, like Psalm 1 and so many of the Proverbs, speak of these two contrasting ways of life, going your own way and going God's way. Well, more on the theme of justice as Israel and the church, the people of God, have historically perceived it, can be seen in that little Psalm 82. Do you know that you could be like God? This is that psalm that Jesus actually quotes um, where he says, uh, you are gods, you're all sons of the Most High. Um, we were talking about this, I think, before. That, um, well, they're, they're, let me just quote that famous saying. All that needs to happen for evil to prevail in the world is for what? For good people to do nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Right? You just fold your hands. Well, I'm taking care of myself. I'm renovating my own basement, and I'm going to sit down there and watch TV. Um, we have to do something. God puts his spirit in us. He says, I will be your God. You will be my people. Let's covenant together, and you will be salt and light in this earth. You will be the thing that preserves it from going completely astray. You have a role as a witness to speak on my behalf, to be my emissary. Paul says in the New Testament that we are ambassadors of God, as if we've gone to a foreign country and we are now expressing the interests of our homeland in this country that we have a relationship with, saying, well, actually, we would like you to, to consider this and to act this way and not that way. So what does Psalm 82 say? Again, it talks about God's role as judge. Why is he judge? He's the creator. He's designed us. He's got the intellectual property rights of planet Earth and the universe. Therefore, he can say, mm, you're misusing my hardware and software down here. This is not what I designed it for. I can take you to court. But because he's a loving, compassionate God, he says, OK, like we just celebrated two weeks ago in Easter, I will send my son and he will be nailed up here, and he will take the penalty, because justice has to be served. And through that, if you put your trust in him and in the power of his blood, you will be exonerated. You won't have to go to court. So this is what Asaph says here. God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. That's what we should be doing. And we know <laughs> in uh, the history of Israel, that wasn't always the case. Uh, sometimes the uh, princes, uh, the wealthy merchants, they would um, uh, take advantage of their position and, um, and, and take away from the vulnerable the little that they had to enrich themselves. Just like Nathan went to David about Bathsheba and saying that parable about you know, the owner who had the one sheep and the rich man, instead of giving the guest from his flock, took the poor man's sheep away from him, is that kind of idea. And so in conclusion, it says, they know nothing. They understand nothing. What don't they understand? That every single person is important because we're all made in the image of God. We have an inherent dignity, not based on our bank accounts, not based on our position in a company, not based on who, how many people like us on Facebook. We are beloved of God. We are precious in his sight. 
And because of that dignity of being in the image and likeness of Almighty God, to take away from a person their access to the goodness of society and the things of the earth, to make them impoverished, whether relationally, um, whether economically, uh, in whatever way, we're doing an injustice to them. And the judge of all who sees these things will call us to account. And he says, therefore, same language as we just heard in Psalm 75, they walk about in darkness, all the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, you are all sons of the Most High, but you will die like mere men. You will fall like every other ruler. If God gives us the gift, the role of judging or blessing, of serving, and we don't do it, just like Jesus said in that parable, if I give to my servant a role to take care of my other servants, and in my absence, they start abusing my servants and, and making themselves drunk and getting fat or whatever, and not taking care of these vulnerable ones, when I come back, I will judge that one severely. So he ends, rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. Now that's a man who was seeing the outworking of God's judgment on his people, Judah, that they were going into a time of exile. They were going to lose their country, the promised land. They were going to lose their capital, Jerusalem. They were going to lose their temple. And they were going to become slaves in a foreign land in Babylon because they had ignored their role and had instead done what was evil. You know, when I was working at the mission, one of the guys in my caseload, I'm going to call him Jerry, um, Jerry had to go to court. And for a long time, it looked absolutely hopeless. I won't get into all the details, but Jerry was living common law with this woman, and they had two sons, and she had brought um, an accusation against him that he had been abusing one of the sons. Jerry showed this to me, and he was heartbroken because he loved his boys, but there was a videotape. She'd gone to a child counselor, and the boys said, yeah, Dad said, did such and such. Um, and he did it so flatly, so unemotionally, that it seemed a bit funny, but there it was. And you know, in these cases, especially if the man's been an addict, um, it doesn't look good. The courts are not likely to, to uphold a man who's an addict, shows that he can't really control his life well, and, um, and there's, a, there's a, an accusation of abuse. But we prayed. And we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed. And this is what happened. When he finally went to court, it turned out that the, uh, his lawyer was able to show that that videotape of the child's uh, confession, uh, saying that this is what happened, wasn't done appropriately. The boy at first said, no, my dad didn't do anything. And then he let the boy go to his mother and the mother coached him to go back in, and then they videotaped that section, and he just parroted what the mother said. On trial, the little boy, who was only about seven or eight years old, said, no, my dad didn't do anything. She was accused of perjury. She lost her two children and went to prison, and Jerry got a custody of the two kids, because at this point, he was almost finished his program. He had beaten his addiction, he had come to know that God was his father and that he believed that he could be a better man and be a dad to his two little boys. And to tell you the truth, to my shame, I was amazed. I just thought, no, the odds are stacked against him. And I, I honestly wasn't completely convinced that he was innocent. But God, who's the judge of all the earth, in this case, not every case, intervened and showed what was really the truth. You see, judgment is based on justice, 
Justice is based on law. Law is based on truth. And the supreme law of heaven and earth is love. You are to love the Lord your God with all you are and all you have and to love your neighbor as yourself. Prayer is communion with God, nearness to God's heart. So that's why in Psalm 73, and we'll close with this, it deserves a bigger reading than I can give it today, but we'll just take it as a beginning, and you can spend some time in it if you want to. But he says this, and you know what? These last few years have been very economically hard for Sandy and I, um, and working in this grocery store, my workstation was right near the customer service where day in, day out, people would always be flooding in to buy lottery tickets. <laughs> and sometimes when it got up to 50, 60 million dollars, I'd kind of go, gosh, I could do a lot of good with that money. <laughs> I could help renovate Knox. I could give our kids new cars <laughs> and so on and so forth. And I sometimes succumbed to it. And I sometimes would watch YouTube videos at home about travels to Europe or these wonderful architectural videos about wonderful buildings and go, that would be nicer than the bungalow I have in West Edmonton. <laughs> and so I would sometimes think, you know, has God forgotten me? You know, it's been a few years now since I've been really in full-time ministry as he, as he left me. And this is what Asaph also experienced. He begins with the conclu conclusion, but then he shows how, at one point, he didn't think this. He says, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. If we want to be people of prayer, we have to be pure in heart. God searches our heart. He puts his spirit in our heart. But as for me... My feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. These people that don't honor God, they've found a way to manipulate the goods, the resources of the earth, whether it's through a corporation, whether it's through stocks and bonds, whatever it is. And they are doing well. They've got a great house. They've got a new truck. They've got all the toys. They go on vacation to Mexico all the time. These people are doing well. God doesn't seem to care. He says, they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from the burdens common to man. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and they clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. The evil conceits of their minds knows no limit. They scoff and speak with malice. In their arrogance, they threaten oppression. They lift up their horns. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them. They become influential. They become leaders and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how can God know? Does the Most High have knowledge? This is what the wicked are like. Always carefree, they increase in wealth. So he goes, man, I wouldn't mind that lot. You know, what am I doing? He says, when he looks at his own life, where he feels deprived, surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been plagued. I've been punished or disciplined every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed your children. And when I had tried to understand all this, it was oppressive to me. Until what? Now this is the transformation. And this is like a picture of prayer. Okay, if we don't pray, if we just go by our senses, if we forget about object permanence, there's a God behind circumstances. There's a God behind the arrogant, and there's a God behind the innocent. He says, um, where am I here? It's until I enter the sanctuary of God. And that's what we do in prayer. We enter the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. They're just temporarily well off. And I'm just temporarily plagued and oppressed. The big picture 
is different. He says, surely you place them on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so when you arise, O Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. You see, they've taken the devil's lie of a counterfeit good, kind of like one of these Bitcoin things, I guess, that one day is up here and the next day is down there. They've invested everything in the goods of the earth and how it's made them feel secure, feel important, feel like they've got the freedom that they need to access all sorts of good things, but it comes crashing down in the end. They've put their investment in the wrong place. Think about it. If reality is, I have been wanting to rescue you since Adam and Eve fell so that you will inherit the new heaven and new earth and be with me forever and have every form of abundance your heart can imagine. For no eye is seen and, and no eye ear is heard. No heart is, mind can conceive all that God has planned for, for those who love him. If I just pray and stay close to God now and act justly, I will receive my reward. So what is he saying? He says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, that is, when you seem to be disappeared and I forgot that you still existed and that justice still was true, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You do hold me by my right hand. You do guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? The wicked don't have anyone in heaven on their behalf. They've decided to invest in the earth and the here and now. Earth has nothing I desire besides you. When I think of this, when I see the big picture. My flesh and my heart, they will, they may fail, but God is the strength of my heart because I, I pray to him. I'm in communion with him. Because I've decided to draw near to him and he has drawn near to me, I now have discernment. I have perspective. I know that his judgment is based on truth and the truth is this is just the caterpillar stage of life. The butterfly stage comes afterwards in the resurrection. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all of your deeds. Friends, um, I admit that I sometimes find it hard to pray. I sometimes find it hard to see God in the things that go on around me. And yet, when I do quiet my stupid mind, and I do get on his schedule instead of running here, there, and everywhere, I realize I've got a great father. You've got a great father. He's not going to let us down. I've got a great savior. You've got a great savior. What he's done on this cross is permanent. Nothing can change what he has done. So let's let the Holy Spirit come into our lives again as we push aside the world, make time for prayer, and dwell on his word. And we will have that peace that passes all understanding. And we will know again the blessing of being children of the Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you so much all the ways you remind us that you're still there and you are still for us. The reward we have in heaven cannot be taken away from us unless we ourselves let it go and grasp the things of the world instead. Help us to be faithful, Lord. Help us to persevere. Just as um, in our own home, we have celebrated the graduation of our daughter Danielle and our son Noah as they persevered through the pandemic, through online studies, through courses, through financial struggles. They've now got the reward of a degree and the chance to be free to pursue 
careers. Help us to think in the same way about our walk with you, that as we persevere, we will get that reward and a permanent home in heaven forever. Amen. Thank you, friends.